Uh, hi, I'm Jesse Denver. I'm uh, the Energy Program Manager with the City and County of San Francisco's Department of the Environment. And I am going to spend some time um, moderating today's panel discussion. Uh, so we do have a few kind of template questions um, that I'm going to be kicking off to the panelists to spur some discussion, but certainly open and invite additional questions to add to the conversation. So from the city and county of um, San Francisco's perspective, we're really excited about this topic. We have some big goals around renewable energy. Uh, Earth Day, we, if you had not heard, upped our renewable um, goals to 50% renewables and electricity supply by 2020. And then, of course, we have our 100% renewable energy goal by 2030. And for us, you know, this connects more to the, just than electricity supply. This really then helps us look at how do we achieve transportation electrification and how do we decarbonize our buildings. So what do we do from a policy, policy perspective to really get natural gas out of the system and start to create zero net carbon um, buildings in San Francisco. So I'm just going to start off, and um, this is for all of the panelists. Uh, how can local governments best convene necessary stakeholders to try to implement these zero net energy reach codes? You know, when we develop policies, we have to have a pretty robust stakeholder process. And so I'd be curious to hear um, in all the things that you've recently achieved or are working on, how have you been engaging those stakeholders? Um, so in the city of San Mateo, um, we really try to engage two groups of stakeholders. One was our local sustainability commission, which is really a resident group, and the other is the development community. I will say the, the challenge was really in engaging the, the, the building development community. And we, you know, we identified all the developers that were active in our city, sent them letters, sent them emails, invited them to meetings. And when we did finally have a meeting, we only got three developers in the room out of about 30 that were invited. But we found out after the fact that they were all willing to talk to us, but just on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So um, you know, a lot of developers don't want to give away their secrets or they don't want to state concerns in front of other developers. So you just have to sort of meet with people the way that they want to be met with. Um, so we, we ended up having about five or six follow-up meetings individually with different development companies, and that was very effective for us. And we did hear very consistent feedback, but they just wanted to give it to us in private. I'd be curious, from Rachel's perspective, I know we've worked together on some recent policy initiatives that have had to engage the development community. Sinan, what's your perspective? Um, I mean, with all of the energy code updates that, that we undertook um, under this building code cycle, we did extensive engagement with the community in order to talk to them about some of our proposed local amendments, not just on energy codes, but, you know, fire codes and other building codes that we were looking at. Um, and we, you know, kind of similar, I think, to, to San Mateo, tried to bring in a lot of developers, only had a few of the, our residential developers come to the room. Um, and a, a lot of the feedback that we got were, was actually from the affordable housing developers in particular, um, especially with the electric vehicle reach code. So, you know, similar to San Mateo um, and also, you know, the city of San Francisco and city of Oakland, we passed an EV reach code under this building code update as well, requiring 10% of parking spaces for multifamily and commercial development to be EV ready. And then actually under our zoning code required the installation of the charging station. We heard from a multifamily developer that um, does a lot of affordable housing projects that that just seemed, you know, really unreasonable because they're not seeing their clientele be able to actually purchase electric vehicles at this point. And so we said, well, we want to have the EV readiness regardless because the transition to electric vehicles is happening rapidly. The costs are going down. There's more used EVs on the market. Um, but the requirement for the installation of the charging station, because it's under our zoning code, um, can be waived by the zoning administrator. So we'll, we'll require the you know, EV readiness, the preparation to, to install EV chargers later, um, but be able to kind of peel back the requirement of the charging station. So when we talked about solar, um, we also had some feedback from developers that are doing sort of um, mixed type developments, you know, some of the multifamily 
or single family units that have shared roofs or maybe even um, mixed use with you know retail on the bottom and you know two or three stories of residential above and trying to figure out how do we deal with the split incentive how do we deal with um, kind of split ownership of the roof itself and how do we figure out how to allocate solar appropriately so uh, making sure that we have enough resources for those stakeholders when we roll out our building codes um, and, and especially the mandatory solar ordinance is really essential so right now I'm working with um, our communications coordinator and community development to continue to message our development community we have a monthly newsletter that goes out called the development digest that provides updates on what's happening in development um, in the city of Fremont and then in addition to that have you know sort of like one pagers that talk about what our different reach codes are and then what some of those requirements you know go into, go into the details a little bit on the requirements and then really provide them the resources to be able to you know get access to financing or grant programs um, and also especially for solar when it comes to some of these incentive questions uh, the ability to tap into virtual net metering. So the Center for Sustainable Energy actually has some really great resources on virtual net metering where, um, you know, kind of one campus can have a solar PV system and have a master meter and then allocate the um, generation of the solar to different units um, through credit. And so, you know, having those resources available is really going to be helpful for those stakeholders as we, as we see this roll out. CSE is doing some great work on um, virtual net metering under their solar market pathways grant with the Department of Energy. Yeah, definitely something for everyone to check out if you're not familiar with it. Um, this question is for Amy since we're kind of talking about net metering and that obviously connects to the investor-owned utilities. Um, Amy, what utility level kind of pricing mecha mechanism, um, NEM policy, rate structures do we need to see to really ensure that residential um, rooftop solar is cost effective? <laughs> Good one. <Okay>. Good one. <laughs> um, you know, I think right now as we're looking at, you know, the, we have NEM too right now, and I think one of the conversations we had recently is if we stop looking at NEM too and start identifying what we need metering to make sure that that structure is in place that can be more cost effective and, and support the consumer benefit. Um, we are also looking at not going to be pricing something that's tight for PV. And so I think the um, because I'm thinking about some of these structures and what does it having some of these pricing. How many of you know how to operate your home without cutting your lawn? Okay. A, a little. I would say I know a little, right? And, and so I think in looking at these kind of rate structures, I think the critical piece is going to be transparency for the consumer. So commercial businesses, the ability to understand how that is affecting their cost structure. Um, so whether that's through, you know, displays or communications or immediate information to all of our devices, so we have a phone number for our computers, um, our phones. Um, I think it's the kind of implementation of those rate structures that are critical that we And, yeah, I mean, you've pointed out some really important uh, things, which is not only do we have community choice aggregation programs like Clean Power SF that have come online or are coming online, and the local control over designing rates um, under those umbrellas, but you also have 
the CPUC kind of eyeing community choice aggregation programs and seeing where from ad adequacy, you know, uh, from a resource perspective, um, resource adequacy perspective, you know, where do they assign some of their control um, to CCAs, which is kind of undefined. So there's a lot of unknowns in this space. And to add to that, then we also have the CPUC's Distributed Energy Resource Action Plan, which of course is the umbrella for a number of proceedings. It's just kind of reinventing the whole thing, not just rooftop PV and how it plays, but how it partners with storage and electric vehicles and demand response and all the other things that come next. Um, so within that, that context, oh, and then there's CAISO, of course. Um, <laughs> Uh, within that context, um, you know, I know that you all have passed these um, codes enabling a broader expansion of rooftop solar. Um, how do we ensure that we avoid negative grid impacts um, with the onset of additional generation? Um, what are you thinking about with regards to what does come next around storage and electric vehicles, um, and how do we ensure that you know each of these things are good by themselves but kind of like peanut butter and jelly they're better together <laughs> okay we talked about it yesterday at the office <laughs> use bacon, right? Bacon goes with everything if you eat meat. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's it's really interesting to think about the future of energy at the point that we're at now because up until this point, California has had a, a pretty constant um, level of energy usage and energy demand. We haven't seen an increase in demand since the 1970s, um, even though we've increased population and we've increased the economic activity. So as we start to transition to an electric Fleet, um, and as we have statewide goals that really, you know, are pushing for us to get there very rapidly, um, we're going to see, you know, huge changes in demand, and not just demand overall, but when that demand happens. And so, time of use is going to be really key in thinking about levelizing um, energy supply. You know, PV is going to be helpful in helping to offset that demand um, at the building site. But then thinking about you know when we see these other peaks um, of demand coming in and and is our generation actually meeting those needs and that's really where sol uh, storage comes into play significantly not just necessarily battery storage but there's all types of storage um, that we can think about there's compressed air there's flywheel like city of Oakland is doing a really interesting study right now looking at the you know neighborhood block level for microgrid energy system and incorporating flywheel in their design for that. Um, so, you know, how do we generate energy when it's available, wind or solar? Um, you know, we haven't really even touched, um, you know, too heavily on, you know, tidal storage or tidal generation yet and how we can maybe use that as part of our storage. But as we start to think more deeply about what our future energy supply and demand looks like, I think there's a really broad um, you know, kind of array of opportunities and to think about, you know, how local governments can be a part of that conversation, whether it's through our CCA structures that we're rolling out, um, you know, East Bay Community Energy is really pushing on the development of local renewable generation and storage as part of our mix. It, it is going to change the game. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering the question, though. <laughs> But, Does anybody uh, have anything to add? I think you are. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, it, it, it's a really good question. And as I was you know, just thinking up here, I was thinking about, OK, we're doing solar, but yet at the same time, we're also thinking of doing this, this all on-site solar generation. So that's just going to magnify our energy just, just for those things. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, but, and, and so I think it is a yes. why we're looking at things that are more integrated. And I think from a local jurisdiction standpoint, it's not just solar, but it's what needs to be done in those groups of, is it deep pump water heater? Is it deep pump water heater with controls and response, right? 
to these things that can happen at the site level. So how can you start bundling those things for a decision at the site level? Um, I think the other thing that is happening, and Rachel just mentioned the project is open that is more involved in the community scale um, upgrade. It's a retrofit of 28 homes and two more homes in Bellingham. But I think from a jurisdiction standpoint, we're often operating at the parcel level. Built at the parcel, I am putting equipment in at the parcel level, and then I'm upgrading the parcel level. Um, things, at least in my mind, is well, what is the best way to do this? And then there's the cost of how do we think about that? And what does that mean for carbon footprint? And do we even need to think about that? And so I is kind of the next level, and that gives a little more opportunity for that analysis that you see in the lower where you have that option for introducing it and where that sink is, where it's sinking at that time. And then beyond that, kind of building on what Steve was saying about the community uh, <laughs> earlier, um, is then as we just look at our production, um, and our clean energy that we can continue to move forward on sanitation and still be net zero. And I think from the jurisdiction level, when you think about bundling things like CR and gas bond type of pieces, um, Yes, please. Um, Amy showed in her chart that you saw the picture of the duck flying, and there was examples of how do we get the, the duck to actually fly and solve our problem of over generation and these challenges. And there was a, a lot of text there, and some text that was there for each of the three ways to do that was controlled water heating. So really using controlled water heating is a key strategy to um, really fix our grid. Um, Basically, heat pump water heaters, it is a form of storage. So as I said before, you can control the water heater. So you're heating your water on off-peak, or you're heating your water when your rooftop duty is producing. So that's key. As well, um, these heat pumps can be grid connected. So you can aggregate them, um, and they can provide ancillary services and demand response. So these are all key um, tools that can help um, with our grid and help with renewable energy. Yeah, absolutely, and that's something San Francisco and other stakeholders who are here in the room have been working on. Um, if you're not familiar, there's a <clears throat> statewide decarb um, kind of listserv that's led by NRDC, and uh, just recently we've 26 um, organizations and cities we put in a, a motion to CPUC uh, to ask them to look at the three prong test um, so that that could potentially open up incentives that decrease the cost of heat pump water heaters at this point in time. Um, so we can talk offline about that. I know how many of you are, what, yeah, oh, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> yes, that's a big topic. And you know, as we move towards more renewables, again, it's about electrification of our built environment and how do we get natural gas out of the system because none of the cities that have audacious um, greenhouse gas reduction goals are going to get where we need to be without looking at how we get natural gas out of the system. So we've all been very focused on solar and now electric vehicles and what will come next is kind of energy storage, um, but the bigger kind of can of worms that's just been cracked open is natural gas. Did you have something to add? I want to say I think um, my counterpart Rachel had on one of her slides that the cost of bringing natural gas into a new building is $5,000, right? So if we can really push for changes to the way that we're analyzing cost effectiveness of uh, all electric buildings to really include cost that ha you know, of what happens outside of the building structure itself and think about the infrastructure it takes to actually bring in gas to, to that building in the first place, then we really start to see that it does make sense to design our buildings to be all electric. Um, and you know the, the the biggest challenge there is just figuring out how do we meet the the higher demand 
for space heating in the winter months, um, you know, that we may not have so much, at least in our, you know, um, more moderate climate zones during the summer months for AC usage. I think in the, maybe out in the valleys, we have a little bit more of a balance. Um, Low during the summer, maybe they're all a little bit more balanced. Thank you. Um, can I just kind of gauge how many questions there are? So I make sure there's enough time. Okay, great. So I'm not going to ask you any more questions. <laughs> I'll open it up to, I have a lot more questions. Um, especially thinking around about, um, you know, how do we all work with our Department of Building Inspection? And we don't have to answer this now, but just putting it out there to the world that, you know, at least for San Francisco in the last year and a half, we've really rapid fired um, better roofs, uh, EV readiness, and a few others. And these are all things that our Department of Building Inspection, that they on the back end have to manage. So we come up with policy ideas and we make it happen. But then we have other people who are really short staffed who have to help implement it. And so we're kind of taking a step back and just saying, we're going to give you all a break so that you'll keep being our friends. <laughs> but I just want to put that out there because um, that was going to be another question I had. So yes, in the purple, and Rachel has a mic for you. Um, two quick questions. Um, one is uh, CCAs are all over the place right now. So how do they play in the um, the Zini process? I mean, if, if I purchase, I'm, I'm a business owner, I have a building, and I purchase the 100% green option, can I buy a Zini if I'm purchasing um, uh, green energy? And then the other question is, I, as far as the duck curve goes, traditionally, um, Electric vehicles have been charged at night. That's sort of been the, the option because the rates are lower. Um, is there a movement towards having EVs charged in the daytime at the peak um, and less at night, particularly as more EVs come up? Thank you. All right, who wants to take the first question, which is, do, do, is, is the definition of ZNE applicable if you're procuring 100% renewables from your local CCA? that question I would say what's the in kind of also in light of the conversation we've been having in terms of if you're talking about like decarbonization of education say what are you offsetting right so is the purchase is the energy that you're purchasing all can it offset everything that you are so are you offsetting that um, the other is what are you actually defining as the and &E, which It's been a challenge with this definition from day one, right? Is it annualized? Is it kind of new? Is it, you know, what is it monthly? Is it daily? Um, I think we need to just really think about what are we trying to accomplish? And the reason why we're talking about d and &E is because we have these amazing greenhouse gas emission goals. And d and &E is an avenue to get there. And so I think if we look at it from that perspective, then we should be making sure we have efficient buildings. We should be making sure that our buildings are fueled with the lowest carbon emissions possible and that our generation is clean. So I'm not trying to give you like a yes, no answer, but I think if we just think about the fact of why are we even talking about z and &E and why is that you know, conversation at the, at the fore of it, it's because when we looked at those emission highs, right, it's our transportation and it's our buildings that have those largest components. And frankly, even though we can do EV charging and cities are doing an amazing job at that, like our buildings are pretty low hanging fruit for us to have a great impact. Um, and so I think that's something that we need to think about. Thank you. Oh, charging at charging at day versus night. I'll let, I mean, if we just talk about too, I've been thinking about it, but there's been, you know, conversation of, well, should we be looking at EV charging more at commercial areas, right? Because if I'm using it on the commute side, then I'm arriving at a destination and I can charge there or the peak side and then charge the peak side. So I think we're charging in those two options and then you can look at where you're having that driving destination and you can charge it there. Um, versus charging at your home. Um, 
that for some people who don't need the car to clean. My car could sit at home and charge. So I think there may be some flexibility, and I think that's why this education and transparency about pricing and how to operate your home effectively is going to be really important for them. And I mean, remember, there's a, a battery within the vehicle, and that battery doesn't necessarily need to be fully charged at all times of the day. So when you charge it up, and also maybe if you have the ability to decharge it and put that energy into the grid when there's high demand, um, you know, there's a lot of studies going on right now for this idea of vehicle to grid integration and how do we maybe even pay customers for the energy that's stored in their vehicles when there's high demand on the grid, um, incentivize them to actually feed into the grid and then pull from the grid at later times when there's not demand. You know, now we have these, you know, uh, moving battery packs essentially as we, as we convert to electric vehicles and it really actually gives us a lot of flexibility on um, how and when we use and need electricity. And I'll just quickly add on to that. Uh, you know, through the state, through the CPUC's DR action plan, I mean, this is what they're looking at with CalISO is how do you start to create those market mechanisms that encourage people to charge midday when there is a lot of renewables on the grid because we do have a RPS <clears throat> mandate and um, with hydro being as robust as it is right now and hydroelectricity, there is no start-stop button on hydroelectricity, and so that has to continuously generate. So we're seeing curtailment of renewables, and when we see curtailment of renew renewables, that then doesn't move us towards achieving the RPS goals. And a lot of these contracts that developers have with the utilities actually have restrictions around curtailment. And to add on, when we see negative pricing where developers are actually having to pay people to take their electricity, like that does not support the end goal, which is the RPS, meeting the RPS um, mandate. So yes, shifting and really optimizing vehicle miles traveled that are based on renewables is key. And you know, identifying who the um, target audience is that we really want to market that to um, is something we're all trying to figure out. In San Francisco, we're looking at TNC drivers, so Uber and Lyft drivers and DC fast charging. Right now, DC fast charging doesn't have a business model that actually works. So we're thinking about how do we pair storage with DC fast chargers, and how do we start to design some interventions that really target TNC drivers to using DC fast chargers um, when we want them to, when there's you know, a high amount of renewables on the grid because they are the target audience to make the DC fast charge uh, model work because they do have that high VMT. It might be that they just need to top off. Um, so we're working with some stakeholders on figuring out what a, a project for that could look like and have applied for some EPIC funds for that. Um, all right, yes. Hi, I'm Betty Sito from DVGL. Um, yeah, so I've really enjoyed the discussion so far today, you know, the convergence of energy efficiency with um, DER, and I, I think I've also been thinking a lot about how um, it's interesting because in the past, you know, we're supposed to not use energy, you know, in the middle of the day, and now we're, you know, essentially talking about a shift, you know, at certain times of the year. Um, but that wasn't what my question was related to. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the new construction mandatory uh, ordinances. Um, but obviously existing buildings is really the, the tough nut to crack and I'm interested in the panelists um, sort of uh, kind of your thoughts on what are some of the effective strategies for the existing buildings. You know, from my perspective, time of sale is a clear, uh, <laughs> you know, a clear um, kind of big bang for your buck, but it's just not politically palatable. It's just not something we can we've made that much traction on. And obviously there are a lot of incentive programs um, like bulk buy programs and PG&E and you know, some of the new PG&D programs as well. Um, but what are some of those strategies that we might be able to use that doesn't require um, the community to opt in? You know, it's just kind of more structural, you know, strategies to really get into existing buildings. I can jump in with one simple code change that I've been thinking about, and that's um, for existing homes, um, a lot of the times, you know, if a home was built, you know, in the 50s, 60s, it's not going to have the electric panel capacity to support the installation of a, a solar 
um, system on the rooftop and you're going to have to actually upgrade your electric panel. That can be costly, but if you already have to upgrade your electric panel, increase the capacity of that electric panel from 150 amps to 200 amps is not going to cost you really anything. And that gives you the space in your panel to add an EV charger or to convert your water heating to electric or to do um, you know, an electric source heat pump for space heating. So, you know, we're talking about new codes, your codes for new construction here with the mandatory solar ordinance, but thinking more deeply about our existing buildings, you know, how do we really start to incentivize people to make that conversion? I think that's one simple way to do it. It would involve, you know, making a, a small amendment to the electric code um, to say, you know, if you do upgrade your panel, you have to upgrade it to this level. Um, as long as there is the utility service to provide that, um, you know, maximum amperage. Something for you to work on, Amy. Yep. <laughs> I, 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 got, I got my notes. I got my notes. Um, I, I think a couple of things. One, I think the, the argument we always talk is kind of the elephant in the room, right? I mean, we need to decrease emissions from our new construction, or just emit less, not decrease, emit less, right? So we can use the term utility service. Our existing building stock is doing this. We need to start taking that down. And so I think a couple ideas, Betty, but like one thing I think we have to work on as a group in kind of getting feedback from jurisdictions is what should we be doing to change the building code, right? So how, what, what things we need to start pushing on there and what do we need to do in terms of like cost effectiveness studies to be able to allow ordinances that go above code to be adopted because that's where for existing buildings it's like, whoa, what's the baseline? What am I gonna assume? How do I is that defensible? And so some of our mechanisms there make it really challenging. I think time of sale is a politically unpalatable uh, situation. I think Berkeley's looking at how they're doing with home energy score and trying to use it as a benchmark and see if it incentivizes or stimulates upgrades later on, but not requiring them. I think there's kind of three options in, in my mind. One is getting a really clear definition where we can apply new construction cost effectiveness studies to substantial remodels because many jurisdictions have substantial remodels. There is very little new, not very little new construction, but less new construction overall if we look at our new home starts over time. Um, so I think that that's one way and we're working on that. If you guys have more interest, more requests for that would also probably help um, push that along. Um, the other is uh, we are working with the city of Chico to look at like a prescriptive approach um, for um, existing homes when a permit is being pulled. So that's So that's something in the works. And the other one that we are looking at that I think has good opportunity depending on the structure of your um, housing stock, the tenure of it, is a rental ordinance. If folks have heard of uh, the smart regs in Boulder, it's their, they require like a performance level for their existing buildings and it's tied to the rental license agreement. And so it's not kind of triggered through um, permitting, um, it's going to tie to that, and so there's a little more flexibility there, right, in terms of those requirements and not having to go through the cost effectiveness pathway to the Building Standards Commission or like the CPC. Um, and there's incentive there for the landlord to do that improvement, and it helps kind of balance out a little bit of, you know, the tension that we have with like split incentive. Um, so those are three ideas. And, and the fourth one, I think, in terms of if we look at our existing energy efficiency programs that are out there, whether it's like advanced home upgrade or direct install or, or other things that are providing new energy, where's the opportunity for those to evolve to continue to bring us to this um, standing step? Yes, of course. Um, just to add on to that, um, it's really essential when we're talking about water heating that we're also, cities are also reaching out to educate uh, plumbers and also give upstream incentives to plumbers. So when your water heater fails, the first person you're probably going to call is a plumber and they're going to say, 
let's just replace your gas water heater with another gas water heater. And that's and that's the point where we really really need to be doing uh, education to the homeowner that that is the opportunity to electrify. And so if, if you're doing, um, if the city can give incentives actually upstream to the plumber to both incentivize them to be selling heat pumps and to give part of that incentive downstream to the consumer, that will make a big difference. So that's another piece of the puzzle as well. Uh, thank you for adding to that. And we are out of time, so if you have additional questions, all the panelists will be here so you can come up and pick their brain. Um, but I would just add that from a city perspective, you know, in preparing a specific sector for a transition from natural gas water heaters to electric heat pump, that from cities, we, we have, a, you know, an obligation to also then prepare the workforce um, to be able to handle that new market. And so there is this additional opportunity for us to focus on, like we did with solar and energy efficiency, um, and the same thing goes with storage. We're looking at, you know, how do you start to prepare the workforce for some of these technologies that are coming online, um, in addition to streamlining permitting inspection processes, taking that page out of the solar playbook. So circa 2007. All right. Um, thank you all very much uh, for attending. And um, again, everyone will be here if you have any questions. Thanks. All right, as you're packing up, just a few additional housekeeping. Oh, sorry, Edgar. So that's everyone's contact information. If you didn't get a chance to ask your question, we'll also send this in the slides. Um, and you can also find it online at bayrencodes.org, where you'll find the hub of all of our resources and online trainings. Or you can email codes at bayren.org. Um, we also have a survey, so if you could jot this link down, of course, we'll email it to you too, but it would be really valuable for us if you filled it out. And a special thanks to Edgar and Claire at Frontier Energy for all their help. Thank you, everyone. And we'll